So last time we covered uh, just basic shading, right? So we, discover, we discovered that the uh, Lambert's law, why do we need a dot product in there and how the light reflects. We have created a simple reflection model, so to speak. Um, there is an obvious problem though in here because we're not getting, it still looks really wrong. You know, because of one reason, I'll tell you exactly why. It's one of the, this is technically in the area of global illumination, technically, but it's usually separated topics. So the problem we're having right now is we're not accounting for the points in 3D space that are occluded from the light. In other, world, in other words, we don't have shadow. So this is a sphere embedded in the plane which is what we have right now, and we have some kind of direct lighting, right? This is the 2D analogous of what's happening on our screen. So the, this point gets lit, right? This point gets lit. It's very obvious that these points all get lit, but this point right here actually doesn't get lit because, you know, if you actually look at it, no direct light can pass through this object and hit this. Well, if this is subsurface scattering, then this is a different topic, but just assume that the object is completely opaque. There's no way the directional light can actually travel to this point, and therefore this point should be black, right? But it should be, in reality, when you're rendering something, there's something called environment light, right? There's gonna be some, some form of sky dome that emits light this way, okay? Um, so there will be light, you know, hitting this spot from like, this portion of the sky plus 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 that if even if there's no sky dome right even if there's no sky dome the very obvious you know thing is that this light like i said will scatter you know randomly radially outwards around the hemisphere that's around as normal and some light is going to bounce off these points that you know hit from here, right? And then some light is going to subsequently bounce off the surface around here. And some light going to eventually reach this point. This is called the uh, global illumination. Uh, this is the phenomenon, phenomenon that light bounces around, and basically each lit surface can be considered a uh, light emitter themselves. So in, an infinite number of points going to transmit light, and an infinite number of points transmit light back to this point. So. It actually is not completely black. There's got to be some color on it, I mean, some light to it, even if there's no sky, right? But it's just going to be really dim compared to sunlight because sunlight is just so much stronger. And when the, you know, the, the indirect light that finally reaches the point already, you know, absorbed by the surface a lot. So you can't do that. By the way, mm, it doesn't really make sense for the albedo to be one, right? Because, you know, one means it perfectly reflects all the light. This is not the point here. Actually, it kind of is, but let's just make it 0 0.9 because I don't want a perfect bouncy surface that bounces off all lights. Just that, that's just not real, realistic. But it's pretty rare in the real world. All right, so what, how are we gonna, the light is coming from, you know, from our back and shooting into the screen. That's why you see the dark edges in here. Uh, as you can tell from the title, there's also something called SSAO that I want to talk about um, in the same video, but because these are um, um, emulating real world lightings and these are what adds realism to the shadings. So let's change the light direction a little bit. Let's say the light comes from the back. I mean, it comes from the front, okay? You will see why. Just bear with me for now. So obviously, area around this here, they're occluded from the light source, right? How do we actually emulate, emulate that? Well, a very simple observation could be made that if a point is lit from the surface and we trace a ray from this uh, surface point back to the light source in inverse of the directional the direction of the light, you won't be encountering any you know, occluders or geometry that blocks it. So you can literally reach out to infinity back to the sun. Because, you know, in order for the sun ray to reach the surface point, there must not be any obstacles in the way between them. 
So what we can do for each point that we're shading is not only computing the normals and shade with Lambert uh, lighting, we can also trace a ray back towards the direction. And if that ray is not traced towards infinity, so to speak, and is instead blocked by some geometry, then we know that it's in the shadows. Now I'm using the term geometry, the infinity quite liberally, uh, and we cannot do infinity, really. We cannot do infinity computations. So instead, we're going to just um, putting some limit to how far our light rays can reach. So our scene is um, this: the radius of the current sphere is one, right, and the plane is reached out infinitely, but the camera can only see so much. We can limit the we we'll call this shadow rays, like the rays are projecting back to the sun. Let's call these shadow rays, okay? And there's we can limit shadow rays. Again, the t of t is coming from the uh, ray parametric equation. It's how far away it is. So we can set t to be in, within the range of zero and twenty, and twenty is some kind of upper bound to the uh, the, the length that we want to trace back. So normally that works. And if your scene is big, just tweak the upper bound. Usually, of course. So this is how you work around the infinity dilemma. All right. So I want to delegate it to some other function. So irradiance, irradiance is really the light from the sun, right? So what we can do is to call some shadow function that gives a point, which is the point being shaded in the light direction. Is L, which is, you know, L in here is actually the inverse of sun direction, so it's perfect because we need a direction that we trace back from the light rays. So this is the inverse light direction. All right, so there's no shadow point here. But I wonder, why don't I just reuse the intersect? Well, there's actually a good reason for it. We will see. So we're pretty much doing the same thing as the intersect routine, okay? So T, we have some T here. And actually, we're going to put the T max here, which is going to be 20. Okay. So we do some similar in um, similar ray marching code. So the SDF is going to be T plus T dot L. L is normalized. And we plus and ignore this shit in here. So because we don't care about what the material is. And if you know, D is less than 0 0.1 or some small value. Actually, this is important. I need to talk about it. So if this means there's occlusion, because you, you're not supposed to hit any objects, so it returns zero, means that the shadow terms returns how much the light you get. So zero means you get zero percent of the sunlight because it gets blocked. Otherwise, if there's no, you know, we don't encounter anything, we just return one. And in here, if t is bigger than t max, we just break out. Or you know, yeah, we just break out. We need, uh, this this here is mainly for optimization purposes because we're doing like a finite iteration anyways. So if this hits the upper bound, we don't have to keep iterating into infinity because that's all wasted computation, right? All right, so it still doesn't compile because p doesn't exist. Well, let's just let's put um, I'll this which is p, and you will see something immediately that if you're not careful with how you do shadows can look like this. This is called shadow acne in research literatures. Um, usually you encounter this term when you do rasterization based shadow algorithms. So like shadow mapping is one where acne is the most prevalent. In here there's actually a way to counter this effect. Okay. So why is this thing happening? Okay, why is it happening? So there's going to be, you know, first of all, we trace the ray to some, we will ray march the ray up to some point. And this point is kind of infinite, almost very, very small to it. We set some limit to it, right? So this is going to be a, um, a value smaller than 0 0.01. Why do we want to trace the ray back, though? Have you ever thought about that? You need to push the ray out of the geometry that we're intersected with a little bit then you trace back to the light ray. Otherwise, you have the intersection would stop immediately at where you start from the shadow ray, and it would just say, hey, this is occluded. Even when in actuality, sometimes, you know, 
it may not be actually occluded. So that's the problem here. The fix is very simple. You either increase the amount of error you tolerate for shadow rays, or you just, you know, increase the initial T a little bit. If we increase the initial T, it's gonna, you know, move up out of the shadow ray a little bit, right? So we can just do this. You can see it instantly, you know, it's, it's much better. But 0.1 is a little too big. Um, actually, that's just fine, I think. So let's try to find a value that where the, the artifact stops. So 0. Point, I mean, you can still see a bit of acne on the side. Yeah, that's kind of the, the, the edge area is kind of the special case we need to take care of. So um, 0. 0.1, I guess it's all right. Or you can up the limit, which you know, not a good idea. So I think 1.0.1.15 is a good yeah, a good a range for the initial push out of the sunlight. As you can see, it's not very clear the shadow here. Kind of, you can kind of see it, but we can tweak the light direction a little bit to make this more obvious, right? To do this. Okay, there is a problem. Um, okay, that's just because you know we kind of want to push it out from the normal instead of the ray. So whatever. Um, the problem here. Let's see. Give me a minute. What do I do if I push this thing out a little bit? This is just a bit of a transformation on the space. Okay, so something's obviously wrong with it. I don't mind what I'm doing. It's just that you're not supposed to understand it just yet, but I want to talk about it eventually. Um, so D is equal to zero. Okay. This is very interesting. This is the problem. Oh, of course. I forgot to advance the T if I have no intersection. There you go. So that is the hard edge shadow that we were seeking. So if we change the light direction back a little bit, you can see you now the shadow follows or if the light is pointing at. Right? So that's very cool. And there's actually, you can do soft shadow approximations. This is not physically based soft shadow, but it'll give you a sense of realism either way. So there's something called Umbra. Or numbra. So umbra and penumbra. And you will hear from the literature. So umbra is the area of the shadow. So the shadow usually consists of two regions. One is umbra, one is penumbra. Umbra is the area inside shadow that's actually a hundred percent occluded from the primary light source. Penumbra is the soft edge around it that's kind of soft because partially the light comes through and hits these points so they don't get the entirety of the light but they do get a little bit so that's why sometimes you see soft shadow and usually this occurs under area light sources because you know uh, all the light source affected to at some point and it stops you kind of do an integration of the visible the vis visibility term here and it's not just a simple zero and one but in our case since we're doing directional lighting where this is in our case, it's actually a zero, zero and one uh, thing here, if it's complete directional light. Right? But sometimes, you know, light bounces off, who knows what happens. It's traveling in an a, a, a homogeneous, a homogeneous medium, which is usually what the case is in reality. So you can still see some kind of soft shadow. Um, so the, the way we approximate this so now we have, what, what do we have? We have the umbra. There's no penumbra here. How do we, how do we get penumbra? Notice since, uh, this is actually very, quite convenient since we're already using SDF. We want the rays that are scraping very close 
to you know there are going to be rays that scrape really close to this to the geometry towards the light you know um we want these rays to instead encode shallow as zero or one we want it to have some kind of intermediate value right if so if the ray scrapes through a uh, scrape by the object by just a tiny bit we want to record this distance and use this distance as some kind of interpolation the uh, coefficient for how soft the shadow is on this edge and if it's you know too you know way out then this is going to be a hard edge okay it's actually quite easy to do you can kind of think of it as cone tracing for shadows so exactly what's the cone that you can you know expand out that doesn't include any geometry and this is actually how you soft shadows with aerial light sources which we're not going to go here so the simple trick is to find a distance the closest distance your ray ever traveled you know when you trace the shadow ray so how do you keep track of that well this is super easy in here because we're literally returning the distance to the closest the closest distance to any geometry so all we have to do is if it doesn't hit you know if it's not a when we return here we know it's got to be in the umbra so there's no point in the soft shadow so instead we're, we're going to keep the initial result of zero one zero one right and in here we're going to say res equals you know, t which uh, D, which is the distance from the surface, over T, which is, you know, the further away the kind of the soft shadow-ishness gets increased. So you kind of, the further the, the shading point away, even if, if, if it travels, you know, as close, the occlusion it shouldn't appear as hard. You kind of have this, you know, distance, the further away the soft shadow is softer. That kind of thing is kind of pretty pleasant. So if you do that, it's gonna look not gonna look great because each point is equally getting you know all the res gets set to some big value anyways. If you do minimum of res in T, boom. Um, let me explain what this term is. The reason why minimum does this is because realize that res initializes to zero. I mean one. So if this term gives you something that's bigger than one, right? This term potentially gives you bigger than one if t is very small or t is very big. Of course, the value of shadow that's bigger than one doesn't make any sense. So if res is one and the minimum of them, of course, is still res, so res will be retained. With this term, res only gets updated if the value that's smaller than res is passed in here. So we're kind of keeping track of the minimum distance that we ever got to. So that's the point of it. And there's some kind of magic value you can tweak, right? Before it was definitely too dark, but now it's okay. So you can see, you can tweak the, you know, by adding some stuff to this thing. And if we put 100, it's pretty much the same as the hard edge shadow. If we put, you know, 10, it's gonna be quite soft. But there's gonna be some alias in here, you know, kind of have to deal with that. Um, there's there are ways to fix it, actually, but I'm not gonna discuss it here. So four is kind of the, you know, this this is kind of the soft spot. I mean, the sweet spot, I think. I really like this style of shadow a lot, so I think I'm gonna keep it at two. However, there is an obvious problem here. Well, actually, you know what? I'll delegate it to the next video. So, this is going to be Soft Shadow and SSAO Part 1. In the next video, we're going to discuss... Uh, hold on, I'm going to put the 1 here. In the next video, we'll discuss, you know, ways that te or techniques we can use to kind of give you a sense of... 3D is inside the area that doesn't get primary light. In short, what we're going to do is to find. Um, so first of all, there's going to be light bouncing around the bouncing off of the plane back into this, you know, these unlit areas. However, 
you create a sense of real realism by faking how much light of these things they get. It's called the ambient occlusion. And then one thing that does that is ambient occlusion, which approximates how much light it gets. You know, it's depend, which depends on the occlusion term of the geometry, which I can give you a brief preview. So, if a surface is perfectly flat, you know, a light is going to come in at its all its hemispheres, so it's going to get a hundred percent of the light. You know, obvious. If a point has some kind of weird geometry to it, right? So this is the point where shading. If you if you just do the hemisphere. You can see part of the light is if the light comes in from here, it's gonna hit. It. It's not gonna hit it. All right, so let me do it here. So if there's some weird geometry, and we're shading a point here, we, we you know it's normal is around this area. So we do a, a hemisphere integration. You can see light that's coming here are blocked by this small geometry. And if light comes, only the light that comes into a certain portion of the hemisphere, it gets the light. light. So more occluded, you the point is by the neighbor geometry, the darker what appears when you only talk about indirect lighting. So this is kind of the you know topic for next time. Uh, I'll tell you what this SSL term means. It means screen space ambient occlusion. You actually be surprised how easy it is to just do ambient occlusion. A very simple SSL technique for ray margin. Next video, you'll probably be surprised. And um, a better way that I prefer, which is not screen space based, because screen space is really like a hack. Occlusion. What I like to do is to just take the point and we, we trace out a cone, right? We trace out a cone or multiple cones and you approximate how much of those cones are taken up. So you kind of approximate what the integration term would be if you're doing the visibilities. Right? So only this portion gets lit, and the cone trace really approximates the ambient, ambient occlusion term that's in the global world space. So it doesn't have any, any of the artifact that screen space ambient occlusion has. But anyways, that's it. And screen space ambient occlusion will be the topic of next video. Okay, so stay tuned. See you next time.